Sasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Militanyena Tesmai Shri Gurave Namaha Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Desha Tarine Vancha Kaupa Terubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavi Bhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Atvaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadigor Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare You're going to be here? Well, I need somebody to tell me when somebody raises their hands. Oh, I will do it, Maharaj. You will do it? Okay. Yes. Shall I take it, Maharaj? All right. Uh, before we start, we are very grateful to have you back, Maharaj. For some time. Uh, so, all devotees, uh, we have known Ms. Ms. Bhakti Vidya, Ms. Swami Maharaj, Ms. Vidya Vidya Sandana Shrinha Swami Maharaj. Maharaj will teach us for this unit now. And All right, thank you, Prabhu. All right, so this is the final section of the Bhagavad Gita. We're beginning chapter 13. Uh, the first six chapters were describing Karma Yoga, and then the second six chapters, which you just completed, were emphasizing Bhakti. Now, this other section, final section, is emphasizing jnana, and by knowledge, by knowledge one can come to devotion. This is the point, that if we understand the nature of this material world and the different energies acting, if we understand our position as living entities, with that knowledge we will come to take up devotion. So the Bhagavad Gita, uh, Prabhupada explains, it's like a sandwich, the good thing is in the middle. So this is not the good thing, this is, a, this is a, the bread or the covering over the, the bhakti. But the purpose of this covering is to bring us to bhakti. Alright, so we're going to be looking Quite quickly, we have to go quite fast, we won't spend a lot of time because we don't have much time, we only have two hours for the class and we have six chapters to go through. So the thirteenth chapter will need a couple of days, maybe even more, and the eighteenth chapter will take three days and then we have one day each for the other chapters. So it, it's quite fast paced, so we ask all of you. You know, give your attention and we'll do our best to try to bring out the important points. So 13th chapter begins with Arjuna's question. Or the relationship between the 12th chapter and 13th chapter comes from verse number 7 in chapter 12 where Lord Krishna promises that he will deliver the devotee from the ocean of birth and death. So Prabhupada emphasizes that Krishna delivers us. We don't, we can't deliver our own self. We need to attract the mercy of Krishna. And how to attract that mercy of Krishna will be explained to us in the course of these uh, six chapters. All right, so the 13th chapter begins with Arjuna's question. And he's going to ask on about he's asking about six things about the prakriti and the purush, about knowledge and the object of knowledge, and about 
the field and the knower of the field. Right? So Arjuna's first question actually, he wanted to know about Prakriti, material nature, and Purusha, the enjoyer. So that comes last. It's the most difficult topic. So Krishna keeps that for the end of the 13th chapter. But he begins with the easiest part of the chapter, the, the easiest question, which was to know about, Arjuna wanted to know about the field and the knower of the field. So the field, the field of activities in Sanskrit called Shetra, right? Just like we have one Krishna Shetra Swami. So Shetra, the field. So the, uh, the, this uh, term is appropriate for describing the nature of the material body. It's like a field. Just like in a field, you plant different seeds. And according to the seeds you plant, you harvest the appropriate crops. We have a saying in Chinese that if you plant melons, you will harvest melons. And if you plant beans, you will harvest beans. In the Christian Bible, they will say, as you sow, so shall you reap. You get the results of your actions. So this body is a reflection of our actions. It's a manifestation of our karma from our past activities. So in Srila Prabhupada's purport, Prabhupada begins, uh, well, let's look first of all uh, at the second paragraph. And Prabhupada mentions about how the, the, the Bhagavad Gita, how it's designed, that uh, I'll just read for you a little bit from this uh, second paragraph here in the purport. Right? Uh, in the first six chapters of Bhagavad Gita, the knower of the body, the living entity, and the position by which he can understand the Supreme Lord are described. In the middle six chapters of Bhagavad Gita, the Supreme Personality of Godhead and the relationship between the individual soul and the super soul in regard to devotional service are described. Right? So just like I was saying, we had the, the first six chapters, how from karma we come to bhakti. And then second six chapters, Krishna was describing just bhakti, mixed bhakti and pure bhakti, they were all described. And now in the final six chapters we're going to hear about how by knowledge we can come to bhakti. So this is uh, Prabhupada making this point in the purport. Coming back to the first paragraph, in the first paragraph of text number one and two, Prabhupada is speaking about the Shetra, the field of activities, and the Shetrakna, Shetrakya, the knower. The knower, meaning, of course, the knower, the Shetrakna is the soul. The, the, the soul. There are actually two knowers within the body. There's the individual soul, and there is also the super soul. So within every body, there are two shetraknas, there are two knowers, the soul, individual soul, and the super soul. And the body itself is the field. And so then Prabhupada goes on to explain that, he says, any intelligent person, any, any reasonable person can understand that within the body, there's a knower of the body. Right? We will ask you all, you can contribute, you can tell me some example Prabhupada gives to help us to understand the existence of the soul within the body. You can put your hands up if you'd like to tell us something. Yes. Please 
Huh? I think Mataji didn't select the English channel because she can hear me. Maybe Maharaj can call. We have Shilpa Shyam, Mataji, Asim Krishna. Just anybody, let somebody else speak. Okay, okay. So just now Sureshwara Mataji said that there is a consciousness. She said the example there's a consciousness in the human well, somebody may say that consciousness comes from chemicals. How can we understand there's a soul? Just to simply say because the body has consciousness, that doesn't prove that there's a soul. There's many material explanations of consciousness. Hare Krishna, Anwar Pradha Maharaj. Uh, Prabhupada uh, gave an example like if we say my head, this is my head, this is my head, then if we don't say I head, I, I forehead, we don't say like this, it's my. So there is somebody in, 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 in our body who is saying my, then we say my, it's my. We don't say I head or my I forehead, I leg, we don't say it's my means the term. We, all right. Yes, right. That's a good example. Yes. Very nice. Who is the owner of the body, right? We say, we, as you say, we don't say I body, we say my body. So who is this person who owns the body? <laughs> so, that is the soul within the body. There's a soul. Yeah. Any, anyone else? Another example? Krishna Maharaj. Yes. So, that when uh, somebody is dead we say that he is gone oh but, very uh, good yes yes very nice example right when somebody dies we will say he's gone so who's what's gone the body is still there but the soul is left so this often Srila Prabhupada would present these examples sometimes you know Prabhupada would go to schools to young Young, young, young people, young children, and Prabhupada would present these kind of arguments to them, to convince them about the existence of the soul. So this is the point Arjuna was asking about the nor, the field of activities and the nor of the field. So the field of activities, Shitra, and the nor of the field, the soul and the super soul, two nors of the field, right, and then. Uh, all right, so uh, so we're different from the body. We don't identify with the body. All right, so nothing much more there in these first two verses. We'll go on to text number three. Right. Text number three. O sign of Bharat, you should understand that I am also the nor in all bodies, and to understand this body and its nor is called knowledge. That is my opinion. <laughs> Shankaracharya says about this. You know, you know, you all know Shankaracharya, right? Who propagates the Mayavadi philosophy in the Kali Yuga. He says that. Uh, he who is the knower in all bodies is me. <laughs> he who is the knower in all bodies is me. This is what Shankaracharya says. In other words, he's saying, you and I, we are the same. We are one. We're not different. This is the Mayavada philosophy, the Philosophy of illusion, right? He who is the knower in all bodies is me. <laughs> you know, in other words, you know, we're all God. But is it true? Do we know about others' bodies? We don't know. We don't know. We know about our own body. We don't know about others' bodies. We can understand our own pain and pleasure, but we don't know about another person's pain.
pain and pleasure. We are limited. But Krishna knows, the Supreme Lord knows, because he's, he's omnipresent. He's within every living entity's heart. So he knows about these things. We don't know. We only know about our own pain and pleasure. So this verse number three is uh, it's, it's very much appreciated by the Mayavadis, impersonalists. They like this verse very much because they can, you know, quote this verse and say, you see, it's all one, we're all one, we're all the supreme. I am you and you are me. We're all one. This is their idea. And so there is a difference, right? We, so in the purport, Prabhupada gives very nice example, right? Maybe we can ask one of you to to read, please. Where from uh, the second, third paragraph, the Lord says, "I am the knower of the field of activities." Hare Krishna, Prabhu. I'll read. Thank you. The Lord, the Lord says, I am the knower of the field of activities in every individual body. The individual may be the knower of his own body, but he is not in knowledge of other bodies. The Supreme Personality of God and who is present as the Super Soul in all bodies knows everything about all bodies. He knows all the different bodies of all the various species of life. A citizen may know everything about his patch of land, but the king knows not only his palace, but all the properties possessed by the individual citizens. Similarly, one may be the proprietor of the body individually, but the Supreme Lord is the proprietor of all bodies. The king is the original proprietor of the kingdom and the citizen is the secondary proprietor. Similarly, the Supreme Lord is the supreme proprietor of all bodies. The body consists of... Uh, all right, thank you, thank you. Yes, you can... yes. That's right. the point, that was it. I wanted this example, the very nice analogy which Srila Prabhupada has given here in the purport, the analogy about the king, he knows about each and every one's land. We only know about our own land, but the king, the ruler, he knows about each and every one's land. So this is, Prabhupada is comparing this to the Supreme Lord who is the proprietor of all bodies. So the Supreme Lord knows about everyone, just like the king knows about each and every one of his people in the kingdom. The Supreme Lord knows about all the living entities. He knows about all of our pains and pleasures. How does he know? Because he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He knows everything. All right. So, the Mayavadi philosophy, of course, we have to often meet people who present the Mayavadi philosophy. Arguing with them is not always the best way. Usually, in the, dealing with Mayavadi philosophers, Mayavadi people, we encourage them, take prasadam and chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> right? We encourage them, get get some purification by eating some prasadam and chanting the holy name. Because in Kali Yuga, people are difficult to argue with. We can waste a lot of time. We don't want to waste our time with them just arguing. But if we give them some spiritual benefit, let them eat prasadam, let them chant Hare Krishna, if they take part in these things, then gradually we can purify them, give them little bits of knowledge. Let them hear from authorized speakers, not from speculative Mayavadi philosophy. All right. Uh, so we'll go ahead. Let me see. Uh, the body is made of senses. I wanted to bring one point 
which is here in this purport, text number three, talking about Brahman. Because we will be hearing about Brahman in the next, in text number five comes up. So it's mentioned here. If you look over uh, the second last paragraph, at the end of the second last paragraph of the purport to text number three, it mentions there are three Brahman conceptions. Can you find it? The second last paragraph, at the end of the purport, at the end of the paragraph, it's mentioned there. There are three Brahman conceptions. Prakriti is Brahman as a field of activities. The Jiva, individual soul, is also Brahman and is trying to control material nature. And the controller of both of them is also Brahman, but he is the factual controller. Right? So it's interesting because Prabhupada points out here that Prakriti is also Brahman. Now Prakriti of course is matter, but here Prabhupada said it's also Brahman that it also has its origin in Brahman. So in a sense, the material world is another manifestation of Brahman, because it's Krishna's energy. So in that sense, the Prakriti is also Brahman, that it's, it's coming, the material energy comes from the impersonal Brahman from the Brahman and is transformed into material elements. Also a little above that, a little above that in the second last paragraph, Prabhupada is pointing out, one should not confuse, one should not confuse Prakriti, Purusha and Ishwara. Right? Prakriti, nature, Purusha, the enjoyer of nature, and Ishwara. Now Purusha, in the, you know, here we're talking, this term in this sense, Purusha is referring to the, the living entity, and the Ishwara is the Supreme Lord. Actually, Ishwara is the real Purusha, but conditioned souls, we are thinking we are the Purusha. And Prakriti is material nature. And then Prabhupada says, one should not confuse the three in their different capacities. And he goes on, one should not confuse the painter, the painting, and the easel. Right? There we have the painter, the painting, and the easel. Now, if we consider the painter, the painting and the easel in relation to Prakriti, Purusha and Ishwara, which one is which? We will ask you, wh which one is the easel? The easel means a stand, the painting's held on the stand, we call it an easel. So which one is the easel? Who says the easel is Prakriti. Put your hands up. How many hands there are? Yes, yes Prabhu. How many hands? Seven hand raised now. Okay. Eight. Okay. How many say the ISO is the Purusha? How many hands? Huh? Three hands. And the, the, how many say that Iso is Ishwara? We have four hands. 
Okay. And all right, now who what about the the painter? Who is the painter? Anybody say Prakriti? Okay. Anybody say Purusha for the painter? Six hands. Okay. And anybody for the Ishwara? The Ishwara for the painter? Okay, so quite, we're quite divided here. <laughs> All right, actually we would say the Iso is the Prakriti. Actual fact, the Iso is the Prakriti. The who, those who said Prakriti is the Iso, they were correct. And the painter is the Ishwara. And the painting is the Purusha. like that. So we, we have to understand these things. All right. So Prabhupada concludes here in the final paragraph, text number three. In this chapter will also be explained that out of the two knowers, one is fallible and the other is infallible. One is superior and the other is subordinate. One who understands the two knowers of the field to be one and the same contradicts the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who states here very clearly, I am also the knower of the field of activities. So Krishna is the knower. As in the form of the super soul, he's the knower of the field of activities. We know about our own field of activities, but Krishna knows about each and every soul's field of activities. Are there any questions so far? If there are no questions, we'll go on. Krishna Prabhu. Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Uh, Maharaj, I want to ask that uh, by the field of activities, verbally we can understand uh, the material nature also where the jiva performs his activities. So, can we say that this uh, the, the field of activities is the body and the material world also? Definitely. The field of activities is the body in the material world. So the material world also is included in the field of activity. Oh, the material world? Well, we're not talking about the, the whole material world, no. You could think of that as the universal body. If you think of the, the material world, that you think of each planet as, you know, a universal body. We're talking about the individual consciousness. We're looking at the individuals. We're not talking about planets. Yes, Maharaj. is the body, our body. Yeah. Thank you. We don't want to go into the global uh, situation. Let's deal with the individual living entities, ordinary conditioned souls, and look at our situation. If we, we of course. We could say planets are also like a body, they're also living entities, rivers, everything like that. You know, they're all living entities, they all have con some kind of consciousness. Right now we're talking about ordinary human beings. Yes, other other living entities, their body is also the field of their own field of activities. Yes, their body is. 
our field is our body only. Right. Okay. okay, we'll go ahead to text number four. Sorry, Maharaj. Actually, we have two more hand raised. Okay, we'll take the questions later. We have to just go on. Yes, ma'am. Text number four. Uh, now, text number four, Lord Krishna is giving a description. He's giving, a, he, he's talking about, about what's going to be discussed in this chapter. All right. I'll, I'll just read the translation. Please hear my brief description of this field of activity and how it is constituted. What its changes are? Whence it is produced? and who that knower of the field of activities is, and what his influences are. So all of these different points will be discussed in the course of this chapter 13. Right? We'll go ahead to text number 5. Text number 5 is a, a, quite an important verse, and quite a well-known verse from Bhagavad Gita. Right, we can chant the Sanskrit together, all of us. Rishibir Bahuda Gitam Chandobir Vividai Pritat Brahma Sut Padais Jaiva Hetumad Bir Venes Jitai. So Lord Krishna is speaking, he's giving us instruct he's giving instructions to Arjuna because we you know we just heard text number three. It appears, you know, it could be that there's only one soul. When I said how Shankaracharya said that you should know that I am the knower in all bodies, that knower in all bodies is me. So it could be, you know, the Bhagavad Gita is often commented by Mayavadis and they give their interpretations. And Bhagavad Gita is prone to that. that people who speak the Advaita philosophy, that there's only one soul, they will interpret, they will speak on the Bhagavad Gita. So, what is it? How to understand the Bhagavad Gita? Is, it, is there only one soul or are there two souls? So Krishna is speaking like this, and generally, as in our Gaudiya Sampradaya, when we're discussing philosophy, we will make decisions. We have authorities, right? In everything. Who are, our, who are our authorities? Where do we get information and knowledge from? Somebody's hand up. Yes, I think it's not only you. Just raise your hand first. Our authority is the books written by Srila Vyasadeva. Alright. The books by Vyasadeva, Srila Vyasadeva. We have nice books. He's written Mahabharat. He's written Puranas. He's written also Vedanta Sutra. He's written Srimad Bhagavatam. Yes, many books. Anybody else? Any other authorities? Archana. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, our authorities are the, the Guru Parampara and the Chaitanya Mahaprabhu especially. Okay, very good. Guru Parampara and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the Supreme Lord himself. Right? Anybody else? Uh, Hare Krishna, our authorities from, starting from Brahma to Narada and Vyas, Yes, Dev, and then going to Ishwarapuri and the Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the Chadko Swamis. All right. And then Bhaktivedanta Swami. Oh, okay, the Parampara. So generally we will say Sadhu, Shastra and Guru are our authority, right? Sadhu, Shastra and Guru. So in this verse, what authorities do we have? Text number five. Sadhu, sages. The sadhus, the rishis, the first word, right? Rishi, beer, bahudagita. Rishis, so there are there 
they're the authority, right? They're one authority, right? Any other authority there in the verse? The Vedas. The Vedic hymns, right? Chandobir, Vividai, Pritai, right? The, the chanting of the Vedic hymns and Brahma Sutra, right? The Brahma Sutra. Brahma Sutra, which means also Vedanta Sutra. That's Shastra, right? Any other authority? Where's Guru? Yes, Krishna. Krishna is speaking. Krishna is the guru, right? Arjuna's guru is Krishna. Arjuna has surrendered to Krishna. So Krishna himself is guru and then he's, he, Krishna himself is presenting authority. He's presenting the rishis and he's speaking Vedanta Sutra, Brahma Sutra. So Krishna himself presents the opinions of authorities. He doesn't just say, I say. Now we know in the, in the seventh chapter, Lord Krishna had said, there is no truth superior to me. Everything rests on me, just like pearls are strung on a thread. Remember that verse? Very important verse there, seventh chapter. So Krishna said he's the highest truth, but Krishna doesn't use his authority to take an opinion, he, he, he supports his own opinion with evidence from scriptures like Vedanta Sutra and the opinions of the great sages also. Rishis, the father of Vyasadeva, Parasaramuni, people like this, they're all important people. Now, if for example, if we say, uh, We'll, we won't have guru, we'll just have sadhu and shastra. Is that any good? What will be the problem if we just, we, we don't have guru, we just have shastra? The, uh, Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. We need the guru to explain to us the shastra, otherwise we will misinterpret it. All right, yes. If we just go by, we say, I'm following Shastra, we will have many different interpretations of the Shastra, different commentaries. So we need the Guru to tell us clearly how to understand the Shastra. And what if we have only Guru and no Sadhu and Shastra, then what will happen? Shastra, right? Okay, what if we have, what if we just have sadhus? We, just like, you know, you're, you say parampara, right? We have parampara, Brahma, Narada, Vyas, I'm following these people. You know, I don't need guru, I don't need shastra, I just follow these people. I just follow the sadhus, the holy man. Is that sufficient? Yes. Yeah, we need and we need Shastra. We need to hear. We need to hear. 
we, we, we cannot just simply go with, with the words of so many other so-called sadhus. Different sadhus will say different things in different times, in different places. They will teach in different situations, there will be different uh, presentations made. The philosophies will differ. Just like we know, Lord Shiva came as Shankaracharya to preach the Mayavadi philosophy. Why? To bewilder the minds and to bring back the Vedas. And we know the Lord Himself came as Lord Buddha to cheat the atheists. So we have to have all three to be guided. We need sadhu, shastra and guru. And they're all here in this verse. Lord Krishna is presenting them for us. Uh -huh. Is it clear? I hope so. Yeah. Yes, Maharaj. Uh -huh. yes, Maharaj. All right. So in this verse also, there's an, an important purport because Prabhupada is presenting evidence. Uh, is, he takes a statement which was given initially by Jiva Goswami. Uh, Jiva Goswami had used this. It's in the purport, uh, let's see, the second paragraph of the, of the purport. As stated before, Kshetra is the field of activities and there are two, two kinds of Kshetrakna, the individual living entity and the supreme living entity. As stated in the Taitareya Upanishad, Brahma Pujam Pratishta. This is the statement from the Upanishads, from, so it's a Vedic evidence from the Taitareya Upanishad. Right? Brahma Pucham Pratishta. There is a manifestation of the Supreme Lord's energy. And we're going to hear of these different manifestations of Brahman, different levels of consciousness of Brahman. So begins with Anamoya. Ana meaning grains, of course, or depend, one who is dependent on food for existence. And we see this uh, maybe in times of great famine and poverty, people are just trying to eat, just try to get some food to live, to survive. We see this especially among the lower forms of life, animals in the jungle, they have to always think of food, how to eat, to get something, not very easy. A, a, a little baby is a very good example of this anamaya, because from the time of the birth, the child only knows food. And when they're not taking food, then they're sleeping. They simply close their eyes and they only know to eat and then sleep and then eat and then sleep. So little baby is like that. So this is Anna Maya. This is the lowest. This is, Prabhupada said, this is a materialistic realization of the Supreme. Right? Some realization is there, but it's materialistic because you're simply thinking of food. Then, a little above that, we have pranamaya, realizing the Lord through different life forms or living symptoms. We see one living entity moving. And we learn to distinguish which living entity is our friend and who's not our friend. You can see that as a child begins to grow, he becomes familiar with his mother and his nurse and family, like that. And any stranger comes and the child will cry. He's not familiar with the stranger. So this is, this is like prana maya. 
that he has some realization about life. He can see the difference between a chair, a table and a person. And then above pranamaya, jnanamaya, where one is appreciating the symptoms of life. Sometimes this jnana maya is also called mana maya, the mind, because within the mind then we will have thoughts, desires, feelings, these kind of things will come. This is signs of uh, jnana maya, something higher than just only knowing life. We actually have feelings and things we want. So this is higher, a higher level of realization, but again, still materialistic. Then there's a, the fourth level of Brahman realization, Vigyana Maya. Vigyana Maya, where one can actually distinguish between the body and the soul, that within the body there's a living entity. The body is just the dress or just a vehicle for the soul. And so that's, a, that's not a materialistic, that's a transcendental level of realization of Brahman. And then the topmost level of Brahman realization is realization of the blissful nature. Right? This is called Ananda Maya realization of the bliss, the nature of our, our spiritual nature is to be blissful. So when we actually understand or realize our spiritual nature, we'll become fully joyful. So five stages of Brahman realization, which are called Brahma Pucham. The first three, Anamaya, Pranamaya, Jnanamaya, involve the field of activities and the other two, Anandamaya and Vigyanamaya, they are transcendental to the field of activities. So this is an important point in the purport, it's something which we should know, we should understand that there are different levels of Brahman realization. Hmm. Prabhupada explains here, I said, uh, uh, yeah, he says, uh, to enjoy his transcendental bliss, he, meaning the Supreme Lord, expands into Vigyanamaya, Pranamaya, Gyanamaya, and Anamaya. Right? So these different realizations of Brahman are coming from the Lord Himself, that the Lord Himself expands to these different features of Brahman. In the field of activities, the living entity is considered to be the enjoyer, and different from Him is the Ananda Maya. This means that if the living entity decides to enjoy in dovetailing himself with the Ananda Maya, then he becomes perfect. This is the real picture of the Supreme Lord as the Supreme Lord of the field and the living entity as the subordinate Nor, and the nature of the field of activities. One has to search for this truth in the Vedanta Sutra. All right, so Prabhupada is presenting. Prabhupada is presenting these uh, statements for us from a, given initially by Jiva Goswami, which he had taken from the Taitareya Upanishad. So technical, we want to understand that there are different consciousness, different levels of realization of Brahman. And we should you know, just simply be familiar that there are these different levels of realization of Brahman. 
All right. Any questions on this? Maharaj, in uh, this uh, different stages of realization, also we know that uh, there are three stages of Brahman realization, Brahman, Paramatma and Bhagavan. So is there any connection between these stages and that three? Well, here we're, we're simply talking about Brahman, right? So you could say Brahman realization is, comes in five different levels. Okay. No, Maharaj. Maharaj, these five realizations are part of the fields of faculties because the first, the first three are concerned with the field of activities. The first three, Anamaya, Pranamaya, Gyanamaya. And Vigyanamaya is transcendental. Vigyanamaya and Anandamaya are transcendental, right. Yes. yes so can we say that uh, Ananda Maya is uh, the painter, Vigyana Maya is painting, and the last three are that easel? Like that? No, no I, I wouldn't try to relate the painter and the painting to these things. It's a different situation. Don't bring in something foreign. <laughs> Doesn't really relate here. Uh, Ananda, you're saying Ananda Maya is a painter? No, I, I don't think you can say this. No. Ananda Maya, we said that is when the living entity relates to the Supreme Lord. It comes to know, relate to the Supreme Lord. Also say that the Ananda Maya is expanding, right? So he is he, painting this rest and things. I'm, I'm not sure. So. Not simply go by what we're given here. Don't try to bring in something different from outside, from another section. Simply work with what we've got. Yes. It is written here, real power of the Supreme Lord. When it when Srila Prabhupada is talking about Ananda Maya. What is the meaning of real picture of the Supreme Lord? Real what? Real picture of the Supreme Lord. In the purport, Ananda Maya. I'll just read I read. Where from? Where are you reading from? From the same purport. This is the real picture of the Supreme Lord, the Supreme Knower of the field. You're reading from the purport, where? At the end of this Brahma Pucham Tishta uh, paragraph, uh, Srila Prabhupada is mentioning, that means if the living entity decides to enjoy in the feeling himself with the Anandamaya, then he becomes perfect. This is the real picture of the Supreme Lord as a supreme knower of the field, the living entity as subordinate knower, and the nature of the field of activities. I, I still haven't found out where you're reading from, Prabhu. Huh? The, the last sentence of this paragraph. Second last sentence. Of what? This paragraph. Which paragraph? Paragraph on Brahma Pram Second last. Second last paragraph, Maharaj. Last part. Okay. The last part. This is the real picture of the Supreme Lord. 
That means if the living entity decides to enjoy in dovetailing himself with that Nanda Maya, then he becomes perfect. Right? Yes? Yes. This is the real picture of the Supreme Lord as the Supreme Knower of the field. The living entity as the subordinate knower and the nature of the field of activities. What is your question? What is this real picture of the Supreme Lord? What we know that he is there in the form of Paramatma. But why Srila Prabhupada our real picture of the Supreme Lord? Well, he describes him as the supreme knower of the field, right? The supreme knower of the field. What does that mean? It means he knows everything, all the, about each and every living entity's field. And the living entity is subordinate knower. So he's talking about the, the, the real picture of the Lord in the sense that he knows about everything. He knows about each and every living entity's field of activities. Oh, and previously, the living entity decides to enjoy in dovetailing himself with the Ananda Maya, then he becomes perfect. So that's for the living entity, right? The living entity becomes perfect when he dovetails himself with the Lord. The living entity decides to enjoy dovetailing himself with Ananda Maya, then he becomes perfect. But the Lord is always perfect. The Lord doesn't have to become perfect, he's always perfect. Right? So this Ananda Maya includes everything about Supreme Knower, living entity, the nature of the field of activities. Is that understanding right? You can say it again. The Ananda Maya knows everything. Ananda Maya yeah. includes the Supreme Knower of the field, living entity, which is the subordinate knower, as well as the nature of the field of activities. So the living entity dovetails himself with the Ananda Maya, then he becomes perfect. Uh, so the living entity dovetails himself with this Ananda Maya, with this, in this Ananda Maya consciousness, which was described, the realization of the all blissful nature. Prabhupada doesn't comment much on it. I'll have to look on the other quotes. If we, you know, we have a, quite a few quotes. There's, it's mentioned also in the Krishna book, there's quite a detailed section and description of these five different levels of consciousness. But the living entity has to come, his perfect stage is when he comes to this Ananda Maya. Now the Lord is Ananda Maya. He, he expands, it said the Lord expands into... But, to enjoy his tran transcendental bliss, he expands into Vigyana Maya, Pranamaya, Jnana Maya, Ananda Maya. He, does, he doesn't, doesn't mention that he expands into Ananda Maya. The Lord is Ananda Maya, the Supreme, by saying Ananda Maya by a sat, the Supreme Lord by nature is always blissful, he's always Ananda Maya. And the living entity wants to become Ananda Maya by dovetailing himself with this Ananda Maya. He becomes perfect. The living entity has to engage in devotional service to come to this position of Ananda Maya. 
So the real picture of the Lord is that he's the supreme knower and he's always blissful, he's Anandamaya. Can you understand? Yes, yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, there is one other line just before this where Srila Prabhupada is writing, in the field of activities, the living entity is considered to be the enjoyer and different from him is the Anandamaya. So what you are mentioning, you, you are uh, verifying Living entity comes to the level of Anandamaya, which is which is something which I have understood now. Okay. Yes. Living entity is considered to be the enjoyer. In the field of activities, the living entity is considered to be the enjoyer. Different from him is Anandamaya. Right? If he's thinking himself as the enjoyer, then he's not going to experience Anandamaya. He has to become the subordinate, he has to become the servant. Okay. Thank you. We'll go ahead. Let's go to text 6 and 7. We're going to hear in text 6 and 7 a description of the field of activities. A description of the field of activities and its interactions. Right? There are 20 element, 24 elements in the field of activities. And there are seven types of interactions. The interactions, let's look at the interactions that are mentioned here. Desire, hatred, happiness, distress, the aggregate, the life symptoms and conviction. These are seven different kinds of interaction. Excuse me. So interaction, there are seven different interactions mentioned there. And at the beginning of the verse, we have the 24 elements. We should be familiar with these different elements, the elements of creation. Now, in the seventh chapter of Bhagavad Gita, you heard about Prakriti, it was described about Krishna's external material energy, that there's the five great elements, uh, earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence and false ego. All together these eight comprise my separated material elements. So now here in this chapter, Lord Krishna is expanding more on this and giving us a more detailed description of the body or the field of activities, right? What is this field of activities? So it's described here, what makes up the field of activities? We can read text 6 and 7, the five great elements, namely, what we said, earth, water, fire, air, ether, then false ego, intelligence, the unmanifested, the ten senses and the mind. So ten senses, who would like to explain to me what are the ten senses? Krishna Maharaj, Krishna. The, uh, the five senses, knowledge gaining uh, senses and uh, um, action uh, senses which uh, bring about actions. The knowledge gaining senses are the eyes, the ears, uh, the tongue and uh, um, sorry, the touch and uh, smell. Uh, no, 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 you can't say touch and smell, they're not senses. Okay, sorry, uh, they, are not, uh, they are not senses, they are the objects. Uh, the uh, Sorry, the eyes, the ears, the tongue, then uh, uh, the nose and uh, the, uh, the, sk the skin. The skin. The skin. Yes. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. And the, and the, uh, the ones 
which are which uh, bring about action are the hands, uh, the feet, um, the feet, the, tongue, the legs, the legs, the legs, the hands, uh, the tongue, and not uh, just the, the tongue, genitals. not just the tongue, but taste. No, no, not the taste. It's not just the tongue. It's Voice. Voice, Voice, right? Speech, yes. yes. Speech. Mm. Speech. Yes. And genitals and uh, uh, the excretory uh, organs. Yes, the reproductive organ and the evacuating organ. Yes, ma'am. Okay, very good. So we have ten senses and the mind. Within the five sense objects, someone can tell me. Five sense objects. Smell, taste. Yes. Smell, taste. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yeah, uh, smell, uh, taste, uh, sight, form, touch, and sound. All right. Thank you. So the five sense objects. So you can see five great elements. Ten senses, five sense objects, that's twenty. Then we have the false ego, the intelligence, the unmanifested, and the mind. So twenty-four elements, the field of activities. Maharaj, the unmanifested means the Mahatattva or the Pradhan? Yes, <laughs> it means either the unmanifested. The unman the pradhan is the unmanifested, right? Okay, Maharaj. All right, now it's mentioned here also as we go if you look in the purple here towards the end of the purpur, I think the three paragraphs from the end, the five great elements are a gross representation of the false ego, which in turn represents the primal stage of false ego, technically called the materialistic conception, or tamasa buddhi, ignorance, intelligence in ignorance. This further represents the unmanifested stage of the three modes of material nature. The unmanifested modes of material nature are called pradhan. All right? So, Prabhupada is explaining to us in the purple here about intelligence in ignorance, or as it's called in Sanskrit, tamasabuddhi. Right? Thomas Abudi, intelligence in, intelligence in ignorance is means forgetfulness of Krishna. When we forget Krishna, then we come under the influence of the false ego. And from the false ego, the whole material creation comes about. The technical, uh, uh, there's a, a detailed description how this all comes about. Prabhupada actually says here, is that... Uh, you want to understand more, you should study the philosophy in more detail. You should go to Srimad Bhagavatam. Yeah, one who desires to know the 24 elements in detail, along with their interaction, should study the philosophy in more detail. The detail you can find, 3rd Canto Srimad Bhagavatam, Chapter 26, Lord Kapila is speaking Sankhya philosophy. So we're getting some Sankhya philosophy here in the 13th chapter. There was a little basic Sankhya philosophy given in the second chapter, and we're getting more here in this chapter 13. So the material creation comes about due to the false ego. And from the false ego in the mode of goodness comes the mind. From false ego in the mode of passion comes the senses. And false ego in the mode of ignorance come the sense objects. These things are all described in Srimad Bhagavatam. So if, if you had any, you, you were maybe wondering about this uh, 
tamasabuddhi, just to explain a little to you. All right, so th this is a field of activities we've been hearing about. We will go on to the next text. Can I ask a question, Maharaj? Yes. Maharaj, Tamasa uh, Buddhi is intelligence and ignorance. Earlier I used to know that Gyanmaya is intelligence, is coming from intelligence. Now you have, you have clarified, it is transcendental. Uh, uh, so I thought Intelligence is buddhi, so uh, that was part of Vigyanamaya. But now there is a differentiation between Vigyanamaya, which is transcendental, and Nosa buddhi, which is material. Yes, definitely. Different. Different levels of intelligence. All right. Is there any question? No, it's quite clear, Maharaj. Quite clear. Yeah. Okay. Everyone's understood the field of activity, the, uh, the 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 field of activities, right? The Shetra, twenty-four elements. We're going to go on text number eight to twelve. We're going to hear about the process of knowledge. Right? An important section, the process of knowledge. And please note the first two items, Amanitvam Adamvitvam. Amanitvam Adamvitvam. Prabhupada often would quote out to us that the process of knowledge begins with Amanitvam Adamvitvam. Humility and pridelessness. I'm not quite sure how to distinguish between the two, but somehow they're, they're both there. One is hum being humble and the other is giving up pride. And Prabhupada describes humility, genuine humility means one should not be anxious to get recognition, which is, sounds very similar to giving up pride. So this is cultivation of these qualities are part of the process of knowledge. And there are 20 items mentioned here, and you will see different items which uh, are very important in cultivating this path, developing knowledge. We'll just go through some of them. Uh, we'll, we'll read the verse first. Would someone like to read for me, please? non-violence, tolerance, simplicity, <clears throat> approaching a bona fide spiritual master, cleanliness, st steadiness, self-control, renunciation of the objects of sense gratification, absence of false ego, the perception of the evil of birth, death, old age, and disease, detachment, freedom from entanglement which, uh, with children, wife, home, and the rest. <clears throat> even mind, mindedness amid pleasant and unpleasant events, constant and unalloyed devotion to me, aspiring to live in a solitary place, detachment from the general mass of people, accepting the importance of self-realization <clears throat> and philosophical search for the absolute truth. All these I declare to be knowledge, and besides this, whatever there may be is ignorance. Okay, thank you very much, Prabhu. So, <laughs> Prabhupada is, uh, Lord Krishna has presented these different items for the process of knowledge. And Prabhupada begins by talking about this process of knowledge. He said it's often misunderstood 
by less intelligent men as being the interaction of the field of activity. They think it's just something, it's just from the body. They just they think it's just the interaction of the field of activity. But actually, this is the real process of knowledge. If one accepts this process, then the possibility of approaching the Absolute Truth exists. This is not the interaction of the 24 elements as described before, right? We described before the 24 elements, the field of activity. This, this is different. This is the process of knowledge. So this is actually the means to get out of the entanglement of those elements, to get out, to get free from the material body. This process of knowledge can liberate us from the material world. Mm. Of all the descriptions of the process of knowledge, the most important point is described in the first line of the 11th verse, right? We read verses 8 to 12. So, on, in the eleventh verse, Prabhupada quotes, Mai chan yena yogena bhakti ravya bicharini. The process of knowledge terminates in unalloyed devotional service to the Lord. So, this is the most important point. If one does not approach or is not able to approach the transcendental service of the Lord, then the other 19 items are of no particular value. But if one takes the devotional service in full Krishna consciousness, the other 19 items automatically develop within him. All right. So Prabhupada has established which one was the most important, that one should be a pure, unalloyed devotee. One should render pure devotional service. And then Prabhupada supports this with a statement from Srimad Bhagavatam that by doing devotional service, you automatically develop all the good qualities. So Prabhupada has told us from the 20 items which one is the most important. And, and why? He said, without this one, the other 19 are useless. You may have a guru, you may be humble, but if you're not doing pure devotional service, if you're not engaging in pure service to Krishna, what's the good? So transcendental, then Prabhupada speaks about accepting the guru, the principle of accepting a spiritual master mentioned in the eighth verse is essential. You must, you must do it. And going on, as far as the knowledge outlined here, the items may be analyzed as follows. Humility means that one should not be anxious to have the satisfaction of being honored by others. You know, sometimes we have a problem. People who do the Bhakti Shastri course become very proud. <laughs> you know, we, they say, no, no, I'm a Bhakti Shastri graduate. I don't have to come to class anymore. I don't sit in class anymore. I've already studied all this. I'm a Bhakti Shastri graduate. <laughs> so we got some complaints. In some temples they would complain that, you know, we sent our devotees there to do the Bhakti Shastri course and now they're so proud they won't come to class. <laughs> they say, I know all this, I've studied all this. So very important, you know, we should be humble. Don't think because we studied Bhakti Shastri that we're great devotees. That's not the point. Bhakti Shastri is just to encourage us to read Prabhupada's books and to study more. All right, so there are 20 items here. We've heard which one is most important. And Prabhupada gives extensive commentary on many of the items, many of the points.
nonviolence is mentioned. And Prabhupada explains here, he says, generally taken to mean not killing or destroying the body, but actually nonviolence means not to put others into distress. This is the actual meaning of nonviolence, not to put others into distress. Prabhupada explains people in general are trapped by ignorance in the material concept of life and they perpetually suffer material pains. So unless one elevates people to spiritual knowledge, one is practicing violence. One should try his best to distribute real knowledge to the people so that they may become enlightened and leave this material entanglement. That is nonviolence. You see, Prabhupada gives such a beautiful explanation of nonviolence in terms of Krishna consciousness. And he encourages all of us to think about distributing real knowledge. Whatever we learn, we want to distribute, we want to share it with others. This is a very important point. Hmm. Simplicity is mentioned. Simplicity means without diplomacy. One should be so straightforward that he can disclose the real truth even to an enemy. We should be straightforward in our dealings. We shouldn't have to hide anything. Then Prabhupada talks about cleanliness. Cleanliness is essential for making advancement in spiritual life. There are two kinds of cleanliness, external and internal. Externally means taking a bath. Internal cleansing, one has to think of Krishna always and chant. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So these are very important qualities for us to cultivate. We want to develop our Krishna consciousness. Mm. Steadiness, another important quality in Krishna consciousness. We should be determined to make progress in spiritual life. Without such determination, one cannot make tangible progress. So being steady means waking up on time, attending the program, morning program, chanting our rounds regularly, <laughs> these kind of things. Self-control, we have to control the senses, that is actual renunciation. So, False ego is also mentioned, false ego, this tendency to think, I am the body, this is mine, this is false ego. False ego is condemned, but not real ego. Real ego means, in the Vedic literature, it is said, Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman, I am spirit. This I am, the sense of self, also exists in the liberated stage of self-realization. The sense of I am is ego, but when the sense of I am is applied to the, this false body, it is false ego. So 
So the true ego is to understand I'm not the body, I'm a spirit soul. And that ego can be even perfected when we understand that my soul is a servant of Krishna. We understand ourselves in relation to Krishna. That is perfect ego. One should understand the distress of accepting birth, death, old age and disease. These are described in Srimad Bhagavatam. We give a lot of descriptions about old age, disease and death, the miseries of the material body. So we should be, we should be convinced about the distress of these things and we should be serious in our attempt to get out from this material world. Sometimes we forget how much distress is there within this material world. And Prabhupada then goes on, he talks about not wanting to mix with materialistic men. And he, Prabhupada even suggests one may test himself by seeing how far he is inclined to live in a sor solitary place without unwanted association. It's a great test to go away by yourself and not to get involved with uh, unwanted association, to keep yourself aloof from the ordinary materialistic people. And Prabhupada also continues, naturally a devotee has no taste for unnecessary sporting or cinema going or enjoying some social functions because he understands these are simply a waste of time. Of course, sometimes you're in difficult situations you cannot avoid. Sometimes, you know, family life, you have responsibilities, you're expected to go and attend these things. It's difficult, but it's not very good for our spiritual life. It's better if you can avoid <laughs> going to these different things. For our Krishna consciousness anyway, it's, it's better for us if we can somehow avoid these kind of things. All right, uh, going up, coming to the end of the purport, the, the final paragraph. Beginning from practicing humility up to the point of realization of the Supreme Truth, the Absolute Personality of Godhead, this process is just like a staircase beginning from the ground floor and grow, going up to the top floor. Now on this staircase there are so many people who have reached the first floor, the second or the third floor, etc. But unless one reaches the top floor, which is the understanding of Krishna, he is at a lower stage of knowledge. If anyone wants to compete with God and at the same time make advancement in spiritual knowledge, he will be frustrated. It is clearly stated, without humility, understanding is not truly possible. To think oneself God is the most puffed up. Although the living entity is always being kicked by the stringent laws of material nature, Still he thinks, I am God because of ignorance. The beginning of knowledge, therefore, is amanitvam, 
humility. One should be humble and know that he is subordinate to the Supreme Lord. Due to rebellion against the Supreme Lord, one becomes subordinate to material nature. One must know and be convinced of this truth. All right, are there any questions on these 20 items which are presented for us here by Srila Prabhupada and given to us initially from Lord Krishna's teachings here? What is actually the process of knowledge? Here is, it is explained about the living of a family, a householder life. But if a householder life is not in Krishna consciousness, they can be abandoned. What about that, Master? So, could you explain the. Yes. Uh, well. Can a common man misinterpret this? Yeah, that's a good point. It's, thank you for bringing this point up, Prabhu. It's very important to understand this. What can actually be given up and <laughs> what is our position here? Uh, in Srimad Bhagavatam also we read about Queen Kunti and she's talking to Krishna, she's praying to Krishna to please cut off my aff affection for my uh, family members and relatives and kins. So uh, here also Krishna is saying this, uh, <laughs> this affection for the family members, freedom from entanglement with children, wife, home and the rest. So as you say, Prabhupada points out in the purport, if the family are not in favour of Krishna consciousness, then they can be given up. Well, Srila Prabhupada did do that, but he did it later in life. He didn't do it as a young man. He did it when he was 60. When he was 60, he was, I think he was 60 years of age when he left home initially. And for some years he was living as Vanaprastha. Then later on he took sannyas. But he did it only with great reluctance. That is one thing which we learn from Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada only changed his ashram with the greatest reluctance. With the greatest reluctance he left his home and then with the greatest reluctance he entered into sannyas. It was not abrupt. We certainly don't want to do these things abruptly. Oh, you have a big argument with your wife, right? I'm leaving. <laughs> you know, that's not the way to do it, no. And certainly one has a family, you may, you may have young children who are dependent on you, you have a responsibility. So a devotee is not neglectful. We have family, we have wife and children, they depend on us for maintenance and for affection and support. It's our duty to fulfill that commitment. We bring them into the world, we make a home, we shouldn't leave it abruptly. Of course, we should encourage them also to try to become Krishna conscious. We often have the problem with ladies who have a husband who is not favourable to Krishna consciousness. It's, that's more difficult for ladies. What can we tell them? We can simply tell them this is your karma, that you have to accept this arrangement. That this is the, your karma. Krishna has put you in this, into this uh, life. They have given you this partner in your family life. So you have to accept it. 
And at the same time, you have to try to become Krishna conscious. And Prabhupada gives an example, just like the woman may have a, you know, she, a Prabhupada told the story that the woman has a husband, but she has a secret lover also. So she doesn't want her husband to know that she's having an affair with another man. So she's very careful to do everything very nicely at home. She takes good care of the home. She does everything very properly, very nicely, keeps the home so clean and does it. And she's very sweet with her husband. But as soon as the husband goes off, she also goes off and she's with her other man. She, she's thinking of the man. Even when she's with her husband, she's thinking about this man. So Prabhupada said like this, the woman may think of Krishna, although she has a husband, she thinks of Krishna within her heart. So Krishna is like the paramour, like the secret lover of uh, the, the woman. And so you have a, we, 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 you know, different people have sometimes these family situations which can be very difficult, very challenging. But if we're Tolerant. That was one of the qualities of the process of knowledge. Tolerance. That you have to be very tolerant in these kind of situations. And, you know, people sometimes are very worried about what you're getting into. They don't want to get go into something which is going to give them a lot of trouble, a lot of difficulties. So you have to be patient and tolerant. And you have to try to encourage them, but not putting too much pressure on them and showing this genuine care and concern for them and tolerance. Yeah, we have to, this, this is my karma, I'm in this situation. And until the children grow up and until you're ready, and you, 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 you feel you're sufficiently mature and practiced, you're ready to leave home, there's no question of leaving home until, you know, you're, you're really ready for it. So that's the point. Older age, and, you're, and you've been associating regularly with the devotees, you have... Uh, some service which you can go to, you're able to take up some activity. You don't want to just go and loiter in the streets, or you don't want to just go and loiter around temples. You, you want to have some actual engagement. So you should be working and trained, and the temple is ready, they're welcoming you, they have some engagement for you, like that. So, we only change the ashram with the greatest caution. But the point is freedom from entanglement with children. You know, we have to, you know, you have a wife and children, you have a home. We shouldn't get too much entangled with the mundane affairs of the family life. That's the, the point. Many people, they live at home and they have the t a television and they'll sit and watch television all night. They won't do anything really devotional. They never chant the rounds because they spend all their time talking and playing with the children and with the wife. So they never chant. They never read the scriptures. They never hear, never play kirtan, they can never hear the kirtan, these kind of things. So, one has to be cautious living at home with a family. It, it can be a great help in Krishna consciousness. If the wife and the children, if they're taking Krishna consciousness up, it can be a great impetus. It can be a very beneficial experience to live with a wife and have children who are all devotees. It's very good. We want to have our children grow up to be devotees. 
It's very important that our children should become devotees. But if the children see mother and father every day quarrelling and fighting, if they see them arguing all the time, and if they, if they don't see any Krishna consciousness for them, then the children are not going to be inspired, or they won't be encouraged. Or if the children think, oh yeah, my father, he was a devotee, he left my mother, he left us, he ran away from home and left us, he left my mother to bring us up, then it will give them a very bad impression about devotees. So these are some thoughts on this matter. Yes, any other questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, um, didn't explain here, Maharaj, as we are a Grihastha, we sometimes want to do service in the temple. Uh, stay in a few days in temple and then coming back home after a few days and doing our uh, prescribed duties. So, what about that kind of action? Is it good? Well, staying in temple for some days. And for some days. It depends on the home situation. It depends how much are you needed at home. You know, if you have young children and you just go away from home to stay in the temple and leave your wife to take care of young children, that is not very good. Because the young children are there and the, simply the mother is there to take care of them. It's quite a strain on her. And she, unless, unless she is also a devotee. If she is also a devotee and she gives you blessings, then it's all right. But if she's not in favor, and she feels that you should really be at home and help her to be there with the children and oversee the children. Then, you know, you better, better to be at home. You should be at home. So you have to really talk to your wife and find out what is her thinking on it. Is she agreeable? If she's agreeable, then it's all right. That's the main point. You don't want to create stress in the home, in the relationships. And if you just run off and leave her to take care of the children, then it's not very good. She, you know, she may get really upset. She will think, what kind of husband is this? In some way, but like I say, if she's a devotee, she may be very glad that my husband's really devotee. He's so nice. He's such a good devotee. He likes to do service in the temple. So you have to take care of the home. You have to make sure the home is set up in such a way that you are able to go and stay in the temple. Your first business is to set up the home nicely so that everything will go on in your absence. Do you understand? Thank you, Mara. Thank you for, for blessing. Thank you. <laughs> Hare Krishna. And next question there is from Asim Krishna Prabhu. I'm sorry, Maharaj. Maharaj, I'd like to ask that uh, how, what of, about Brahmachari who is uh, trying to practice devotional life, but uh, it's very difficult to satisfy the parents and at the same time do bhakti because uh, the parents always want his child to stay with them. So how to make both things be done? Yes, very difficult situation. We, we see devotees in India, they have similar situations, you know, their parents are not so eager. Their parents want the child to stay with them, they want the child to get a job, make money and give money to the parents, take care of the parents. So often what, the, the, what they will do is the boy will get a job for some time 
and he'll make some money and give that money to the parents and say, all right, I'm giving you this money, now I'm going to temple. I'm, I don't want to, I don't want to just be, you know, with you, I don't want to just be here in the family life, I want to join and go and live in the temple. So I'm finishing my commitment to you, I've give, I'm giving you this money, you take care of yourselves, but I want to go and live in temple, I want to practice the spiritual life, I want to take up seriously the brahmachari life. Otherwise, your situation is a bit like Raghunath Das Goswami. You know, Raghunath Das, before he renounced, he was, of course, he was in a very wealthy home. His parents had him married to a very beautiful young woman. And he had so much wealth, but he didn't want any of it. And he ran away. But his parents would bring him back. And every, many times he ran away and his parents would bring him back. But finally, he, got the, he was able to get blessings from Lord Nityananda. And after the blessings from Lord Nityananda, it happened that there was an occasion where Raghunath could actually escape. And he ran away and he got off, he went all the way to, from Mayapur, he went to Jagannath Puri to be with Lord Chaitanya. And he didn't go back, he never went back again. He came to Lord Chaitanya and Lord Chaitanya gave him instructions. Now initially he had met Lord Chaitanya before and he told Lord Chaitanya he wanted to leave home. At that time, Lord Chaitanya told him, he said, don't be foolish, don't act like a mad person. He said, don't be a sahajya. Sahajya means one who takes everything cheap. He said, behave properly. He said, keep Krishna in your heart and go on just like a normal person. But keep Krishna in your heart. So Raghunath Das went home and he behaved very nicely, his parents were very happy. But still it happened, he managed to escape, he left home. And he went to Lord Chaitanya and he renounced everything. So his parents tried to get him back, they sent money, they sent people, but he sent them back. He didn't want the money, he didn't want the people. He wanted to just be with Lord Chaitanya. So finally his parents understood that their son is just going to be a sadhu, he's just going to be a holy person. So you have to be patient, you have to also think how you can satisfy your parents, how, you know, maybe you have to earn some money and give it to them first of all, so that you can be free of your commitment to them. Otherwise, maybe you have to run away like Raghunath does. Yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, generally they expect some time emotional support rather than money. But I understand, Maharaj, what you say. Yes, I mean, brahmachari life is not to live with your parents. Brahmachari life means you live with your, live in the ashram with the guru. That's brahmachari life. When you live at home, you're not living in the temple, you're living at home, then that's bachelor, you're a bachelor, you're not married yet, you know. So that's another way around it, that you marry a devotee girl and then your parents will be happy, we hope, that you marry a devotee girl and you have a family and like that you can practice more Krishna consciousness in family life. I'll try my best. Yeah, you have to consider what, what way you want to go. Do you want to be a brahmachari life? you want to practice full-time devotion? Or you want to be, you know, outside in the congregation, practice like that? And so you can take a wife and you have a family, you have a home, and, and this way your home can be Krishna conscious. Of course, but you have to marry a devotee girl. That's important. You have to marry a woman who's a good devotee, and then you can be sure you can have a nice devotee home.
Yes, any other question? Yes, Maharaj. There's from Bhantim Govinda Prabhu. Adrishtam Maharaj, Dhanta Prana Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, there's one question about humility. This is one of the important quality which we have been uh, discussing time again in most of the classes. Um, just wanted to understand how do we know that we are actually developing the quality? Now, externally, if I look at myself, externally, yes, we try to, as far as possible, try to be humble. But internally, are we really beginning, becoming humble is a big question. So how do we know that, Maharaj? Well, Lord Chaitanya gives us some in indication from the Shikshastika. He talks about, you know, the third verse? Offer amanina manadena, amanina manadena, offering all respects to others and not being anxious for respect for herself. Then kirtaniya sadahari, then you can chant the holy name constantly. So the more we have that mood of offering respects to others, giving respect to people, not wanting respect for herself then the easier it is for us to chant the holy name. So it's all related to the, our taste for the holy name. The more we are really genuinely humble, we, the more we will have that taste for the chanting of the holy name. We will take shelter of Lord Krishna in the form of his holy name. And the more we see faults in ourselves and see the good in others. This is also very a good thing, a good quality to develop. This will help us also to develop the more, to, to have more taste for the holy name. The tendency of most of us, we, we, we see our good, we see only our good fault, our good things, our good qualities, we don't see our bad qualities. But when we look at others, we only see faults, we don't see good. So we have to change that. We have to see the faults in ourselves and the good in others. Then it's easier to be humble and to chant the holy name. So we have to train the mind in this manner, to look, to see good in others and to praise others and appreciate others. This is how we can cultivate this quality of the this humility, becoming the servant, becoming the selfless servant. Our Krishna consciousness movement is all about service, right? We're the original service industry. Service means to serve all the parts and parcels of Lord Krishna. Not only just serve Krishna, but serve all of his parts and parcels also very important for us. So, Thank you, Maharaj. Thanks a lot. There is still one more question, Maharaj. All right, one more, yeah. Ananda Vijaya Prabhu. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Dandavat Pranam. Hare Krishna. So, Maharaj, I have one question that... Uh, uh, so many devotees are sometime, I mean, they long time following this uh, Krishna consciousness. Some, uh, some of them uh, stay in the temple, but still quarreling is going on sometime in the temple, even uh, like that, uh, that temperament, like that. What we are, how is, uh, because they already chanting Maham Mantra very long time like that, still temperament, what is uh, the hungry mood is uh, still in their heart. Yes, it's not very good, not very good example for other devotees to see. What we can say is there has to be regular istagosti and uh, powerful preaching about the importance of character and being, you know, warning people about the dangers of arguing and 
this kind of the, creating quarrel, having quarrels, that these things are not meant to go on in the temple. It has to be presented to the to the all the members of the temple, they should all know what is our proper standards, what are the proper standards of a Krishna conscious community, how we live together. And so it may be that there's not enough senior presence there. They may need to have more senior presence there to help them to stop this arguing and biting, fault finding. We know sometimes these tendencies are definitely there. And some people, they do have that habit, it's, it's definitely true. And it doesn't create the right mood in the temple. It, it, it's a serious problem. The important thing is to have more kirtan and more preaching. The more there is preaching and kirtan going on, the less this can go on, the less the arguing and the less the quarreling. So we have to put more emphasis on hearing and chanting, bringing devotees to the higher plant. So this education of the devotees is also very important and very helpful, getting devotees to take part in these educational programs studying Prabhupada's books, reading them regularly, explaining them and discussing them with each other. We have to develop this taste. It's so important for us. And gradually you see that the more we put the emphasis on to hearing and chanting, then the more the spiritual atmosphere will develop in the temple. The arguing and quarrelling can only go on when there's no hearing and chanting. So I really encourage you to put more emphasis on the spiritual program. Regularly reading Prabhupada's books, coming together, having Ista Ghosties, discussing these different spiritual issues, very important. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you for your question. All right. So, any other final question? Otherwise, we will finish here today. We did quite well. There, is, there was one hand from Maharaj Prabhu. Oh, all right. Yes. So I just want to know uh, how we can understand the good qualities of others if uh, we cannot know the we are not know, knower of other of others like this how to understand well here we have a list of 20 good qualities right there's a big list here qualities we can understand good qualities. Somebody is humble, somebody is non-violent, they don't argue, they don't quarrel, they don't give pain to others. Somebody is very tolerant and somebody else is, has the quality of simplicity, they're straightforward. So many different qualities have been mentioned here in Bhagavad Gita. You can study chapter 16. We're going to look in a, a few days. We'll go on to chapter 16. 16 describes divine and demoniac qualities. So you can understand who's got the divine qualities and who you should know which qualities a person is displaying. You know when somebody is humble, when they're violent, when they're arrogant, when they're proud, when they're humble, we know. So you know who's got the good qualities and who hasn't. What's the difficulty? 
No, it's all made very clear for us here in the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna is describing for us each and every quality. Of course, some of these qualities can be abused, just like we spoke about uh, freedom from entanglement with children, wife, home, and so on. So someone may go away from home, they may leave their wife with three children, young children, no means of support. And, and, and in fact, even what happened, Srila Prabhupada was in Hong Kong one time, when an Indian man came to him and said, I, Swamiji, I want to take sannyas. And Prabhu, Prabhupada asked him, why? The man said, oh, I have a wife and four children at home, it's terrible. <laughs> so, of course, Prabhupada didn't give him sannyas for that. But people are like that. People come and they want to surrender to Krishna, they want to give up their responsibilities. They may have elderly parents that, who are depending on them, so you can't just run off and leave them, right? So we have to know how to use these qualities properly and what is the proper use and what is the improper. Just like it mentions aspiring to live in a solitary place. And so people may want to just live in a solitary place just to get, just to let people think they're great devotees. They may go and live in a cave. Oh, people, look, I'm living in a cave. I'm so advanced. And they don't chant. <laughs> they just think of Maya. And then a detachment from the general mass of people, detached from the general mass of people, but they're not chanting, they're not reading Prabhupada's books, they're not Krishna conscious. So it's not just, you have to understand these qualities properly. There's usage and abusage. So we shouldn't abuse these things. Detachment. Somebody may say, oh, I'm very detached. I never clean my house, I never bathe, I never wash my clothes, I'm very detached. Is it clear? Is it any help to you? Yes, sure, Maharaj, thank you. Okay. Yeah, if there are questions, we can take. Sir, Krishna problem, please. Yes. Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Salam Diri, sir. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Okay. Yes? Yeah. Could I ask a question on uh, verse 7? Yes, all right. See, there are seven interactions. Out of these seven interactions, there is desire. Desire is most similar to lust. We know that case of lust in uh, earlier uh, chapters is sense, mind and intelligence. Similarly, these interactions which also include hatred, happiness, distress, where do they reside? From where do they rise? In the 24 elements or what is their position in the material composition? Well, they may reside in the mind, De definitely happiness, there's happiness in the senses, there's happiness in the mind, it could also be in, te in the intelligence, and so happiness is there, distress can also be there. Hatred, again, that's a, a mental thing. Distress, generally they're more with, concerned with the mind, it appears. But from the mind, the consciousness of the mind will influence the body. It's all the field of activities, right? They're all 
interactions of the field of activities. Maharaj, what about aggregate, five symptoms, convictions? So the aggregate means the total, that means everything, means the body, the field of activities. The aggregate. I don't really understand how it's one of the interactions, but, well, all the different elements together, the different elements, the 24 elements of the field of activity, they combine together to make the body. So it becomes the aggregate. The symptoms and the conscious uh, conviction, is it? Conviction. Yeah. Conviction. So, yeah, somebody's convict. I'm, I'm convinced. Conviction. I have to do this. I'm very, <laughs> this is right. I'm convinced about it. So this is going to be, again, uh, mental. Generally, these interactions from the mind and from the mind will manifest, just like we say the face is the index of the mind. So it's happiness, somebody's happy, you can see it in the face. The happiness may be in the mind, but you can, be, you can see it through the senses, through the face. And similarly with distress, you can see, you can tell when someone's in distress. All right? Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. All right? Sir. Yes? Question from the Amount of Sadhguru. My Sikh, my Veda Veda, Tan Guru. Hello, Mr. In my life of Krishna Consciousness, Maharaj, I still discriminate between Gurus. So what should I do in that discrimination of different Gurus? Well, I don't think it's so wrong to discriminate between gurus. You're entitled. You do have some freedom there. I mean, it's not that we force everyone that you have to take this person as a guru. It's one thing to see them as a guru. It's another thing to see them as devotees. You shouldn't discriminate against people as devotees. But not, you're not obliged to accept each and every one as a guru. Guru is a very personal thing. You can decide for yourself who you want for your guru. This is in the ISKCON law, that everyone has a choice to, to choose who is the guru, who is their guru. It's not that you have to accept everyone as a guru. You have that freedom. It's up to you. There's nothing wrong on your part if you discriminate. You know, we have our own feelings. We have our own right. You can do that. We don't say you have to accept this person as a guru. He's a guru. He's a guru for somebody else. It doesn't mean he's a guru for you. He may be guru for someone else. He may be a guru in ISKCON. He may be recognized as a guru. Doesn't mean doesn't mean you have to be a, he has to be your guru, but still you respect him as a devotee, as a Vaishnava. That's different. Understand? Hare Krishna, Dandi Puja Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, uh, like, I wanted to ask, like, uh, it's Pradhan is the unmanifested state of three material modes. Then there is one, uh, what is the difference of three modes and unmanifested state of the three modes? Uh, want some clarification about Pradhan? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's the difference? The manifested, the unmanifested stage. <laughs> well, the unmanifested stage means the three modes of nature are not yet manifest. If the modes of nature are not manifest, it means it's still spiritual. The spiritual 
energy is there. The material creation has not begun. Because in order for the material creation to come about, the three modes of nature have to be activated. So the Pradhan has to be it has to become the Mahatattva. And from the Mahatattva, then the modes of nature like that. So if you haven't got the modes of nature, then it's very good. It means you're in the spiritual world. Right? It's the spiritual platform. They're above the modes of nature. Very good. And so, it's transcendental, the transcendental platform. But when the modes of nature come in, then we're down on the bodily platform. We've forgotten Krishna. So that's the difference. On one platform, we're, th we're, we're, we're conscious of Krishna. Other platform, when the modes of nature come, we're not conscious of Krishna. We've forgotten Krishna. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Hare Krishna. All right. So we'll stop here then. We'll see everyone tomorrow night. We'll go ahead with this 13th chapter. Please look over the rest of the chapter. You have your own, you all have your student handbook? Yes, Maharaj. And you have the different sections of each chapter there. So please look over it. Okay. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Yeah. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank, Thank you so much. Hare Krishna.